Nathan Walls, and I am a software developer at Vital Source Technologies. Uh, we're, uh, pri the primary office I work out of is in Raleigh, North Carolina, but we've got offices uh, here and there. Uh, we're owned by Ingram Content Group, and they're headquartered in Laverne, Tennessee. Today, what I'm going to be doing is talking about a history of a suite of our applications organized around a common core. And this core dates back to the very early days of Ruby on Rails. So I'm going to start out by doing a little bit of stage setting. This here uh, on this chart is a, a rolled up aggregation of seven different repositories that we have um, dating from August to, of 2005 all the way to this past week, uh, showing the number of commits per week. It's not broken up by a repository. This is just like the, an aggregate number of commits. Um, it represents a substantial, but you know, fundamentally incomplete view of what one segment of what our company does. <coughs> so overall, as you look from the left side to the right side, you kind of see that there's a general trend line that goes you know, very ever so slightly uh, up and to the right. Um, and then you look just past um, this area around um, 2015 into 2016, and you see a giant spike there on, on the right side of the graph. We're gonna, ta we're gonna take a deeper look at that a little bit later in the talk, uh, but the nice thing is, is that uh, with these seven repositories, we have a lot of history starting from subversion, uh, going all the way through our transition to Git. So I'm gonna start with a, a little bit of a prologue here. Uh, Vital Source does a number of things around ebook publishing. Uh, we allow publishers to send us uh, books to build. Uh, they can set prices, determine availability, uh, different, different things along that nature. And then we uh, will sell them on to uh, end users, uh, particularly students in learning applications. My start with this uh, began in Actually, I had this wrong. This should be October of 2015. Um, we're in the middle of an upgrade from Rails 2.3 and Ruby 187. And I was gaining experience across the app suite by working on this project. And one of the pieces that we needed to do was upgrade a lot of JavaScript. Reason being is that uh, the app used a lot of prototype, um, which was going away in favor of jQuery. We had a lot of the old RJS style uh, link to remote and link to remote JS calls um, and a few other uh, underscore remote methods that we were using. And you, know, you had the, these magical pieces that weren't uh, really JavaScript. Um, it was this, these magical Ruby incantations that became JavaScript uh, in the browser. So this led to us upgrading that non, to non-Ruby flavored JavaScript, uh, basically consolidating on one version of jQuery and so on. Um, and as part of this process, I come across some very early code and I run git blame and that leads to a discovery. And part of what I see is some code from the original maintainer of, or the original committer on the project that I'm working on. And so that leads me to, uh, go to Twitter and say, hey, <laughs> I've looked at some very old code today. And uh, this was uh, originally started by Dan Benjamin, um, who you may know from podcasting fame. And he actually, got a, actually wrote back and was a bit astonished that this code that he had written back in 2005 and had worked on for a little while uh, was still in use and substantially the same as when he had written it. So, I got a bit curious about the history of this, um, looking at the code across uh, several of our dis uh, connected code bases and in preparing for this talk and, and earlier, you know, I've talked to several members of the development team, uh, past and present, and talked to members of the business team uh, who were basically present for the inception and the continuing behavior or the, the growth of these applications. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about uh, team growth and changes at a high level um, in practices, uh, between, you know, interactions between the business and between it with developers, uh, code growth a little bit, and then how, we've, how that code has changed. Um, we're, we're gonna go into some code examples, not many, but we'll get to see a little bit. 
we're going to see how uh, developers in the business interact, and then uh, we'll spend some time looking at um, reflections and available lessons, and then um, we'll also talk about some tools that uh, folks can use to actually come at some of these, these um, understandings uh, and lessons that they can draw out of their own code bases. As I was putting this together, there were two quotes that came up. Um, one, of, one of which uh, was just kind of an offhanded comment, and that was, in the absence of logic, there's history. And then a couple that came, uh, the second one came up a couple of times uh, from uh, two different people, and that was, it seemed like a good idea at the time. So in a 12-year-old code base, there, there's gonna be a lot of lessons learned there's going to be a lot of, of changes to best practices, best pra what the best practices are going to evolve. And you're not gonna start out having all of these in hand to start with. But the nice thing is, is that this code has been around for 12 years because it has actually been successful for the business and the business has been successful. Uh, so that's why we still get to work with it. So I'm, I'm gonna go through the history in, in four acts. Um, first one is with the appearance of Rails. And uh, David touched on some of this this morning in, in his opening keynote, but uh, this was the, the original uh, announcement to the Ruby Lang mailing list about uh, Rails 0.5.0, and that this thing that he had been talking about had, was actually out there and people could look at it. Um, now remember, this is before Ruby Gems was a thing. This is before GitHub was a thing. This was, you know, just throwing a library out there and seeing, you know, who would kind of grab onto it and go with it. So, this is July of 2004. Over at Vital Source Technologies, um, there's been, you know, a series of kind of cobbled together automation steps around uh, building and assembling ebooks. Uh, there was a lot of, it was basically a lot of Java in place, um, but there was a sense that it was a very limited process, and the folks who were working on that were kind of basically overwhelmed with its limitations. And there was also a desire to have a very visual process, and so something like Rails coming along actually made it feasible to build a robust web application. So Rails comes in, and Dan had actually been experimenting with Rails, and he found that he liked working with that more than uh, working with a combination of a PHP front end and a Java back end. And so he and another developer, Damon Clinksales, uh, basically started building. They started building this at uh, the Apple Worldwide Developer Conference. I believe this would have been 2005. And they skipped most of the sessions to actually start writing this new Rails application, uh, with Dan focused on uh, writing a front end piece and Damon focused on writing uh, the back end piece. Now, looking back at this, there's a lot that we count on in Rails today that was not there. Ajax was new, prototype and jQuery did not exist, and the Rust conventions that we're so familiar with were not actually part of Rails yet. And what people were used to with APIs were very much around having XML RPC style or SOAP style, or you know, if you did, you kind of combine flavors. And you, um, if you look at the original Rails code base that spun up with this, you actually get a WSDL file that comes up in, in uh, your routes file, which I found really interesting. The other things that we didn't have at that time is Capistrano wasn't around. So there was, you know, deployments did not have the well-worn path. And so there's a lot of these things that we think of as, as fully baked into Rails or how Rails applications get, get shipped now that you know, had to get figured out. But they, but they got it figured out. And so the, this is um, the first commit message. I, I apologize for the readability. This, is a, this ended up a bit smaller than I thought. But this is about 400 files from that first pass at the app that got committed um, back in August of 2005. And what the changelog has is that this was using uh, Rails 0.11.1, .1, 
from March 27th of 2005. One of the controllers that got committed here was a library's controller. We still have one of these in our app today. But as you can see here, that it's still somewhat recognizable as Ruby code and somewhat recognizable as Rails code, but it looks very different than how we might ordinarily write a Rails controller today. So that's the start of Phoenix, which became, which kind of was renamed into Connect in, in time and then later has more recently become an application called Manage. Um, but there's another application, and that's, that's uh, P2 Services, which is a, essentially a services layer, and that was, came along in uh, 2000, January 2006. Around this time frame, Rails hits 1.0 in December 2005. Uh, Rails uh, 1.1, which uh, brought in uh, RJS and being able to write those magic, the magic Ruby incantations that would give you JavaScript for, uh, for Ajax uh, and the remotes. Uh, came around in 2006. Um, 1.2 brought in REST and the REST conventions that we're more familiar with today. Uh, started there. Uh, hit 2.0 in 2007 and 2.3 in 2009. I'm skipping over a few releases here. Act 2. Growing the business, the code, and the frustrations that come along with it. Rails marches forward. Uh, Heroku gets founded. Uh, GitHub gets founded. Uh, Passenger comes out, which uh, which helps out the deployment story. Versus, uh, um, see if I remember at the time, there was a lot of mongrel in use at the time. Um, and Rails, you know, is kind of riding high. It's like, oh hey, you know, if you're building an app, you're building it in Rails. It was kind of it was kind of the de the default thing. Or Vital Source. You know, the, the growth of these applications was actually starting to uh, outgrow how the development organization worked. And so there's a tension uh, between building out features versus time taken to, to like go research business problems and answer customer questions and that sort of thing. And all of this ended up being driven, uh, being very business driven and very interrupt driven. And so it was, you know, some of the developers who were present at the time found it you know, kind of frustrating to actually get work done. Uh, developers had managers at the time, but their direct interaction with that with their managers was uh, fairly minimal. And the applications grew, and developers had uh, an typically had areas and tasks uh, of specialization. So, I mean, it, kind of a nicer way of saying uh, folks got siloed, uh, but folks kind of you know developed areas of the code that they were comfortable with, and areas of the code started developing their style. So you can you look through different parts of the application and tell you know, this developer was involved in writing this substantially or wrote the whole thing. The number of applications grew. Uh, so Phoenix, that, that original uh, kind of uh, front end application um, and the database layer uh, started in 2005. Um, there were uh, VST models and P2 services, which was a way, VST models was a way of saying, hey, we're gonna take our models and we're gonna share them between this code base and the services layer in a third repository. Um, in time, the migrations moved out into their own application uh, called Goose. And then we had a couple of reporting applications for basically providing business data back uh, and the, that was Reporter and Uber Reporter. And then a third version of our API layer, because P2 services involved two <laughs> different versions, uh, came out in 2010. There's a limitation along the way, and that is that um, this suite of applications along with others that were, that were running Rails, were all going to basically be uh, locked together in terms of versions. So everything was gonna be running Ruby 187 and Rails 2.3. And the idea there was we only wanna have uh, machines that look one way. And so if we need to repurpose machines, we can ship them to any other application and there's, no, there's nothing to shift about them. There, any, any application can run on any machine. This started to become a limiting factor because uh, Rails hit 3.0 um, in 2010. Uh, this, I'm sure uh, folks who were in uh, doing Rails development back then, remember this was the big uh, community merge with Merb. 
Um, there were also a lot of like active record changes around that time. Uh, Ruby itself hits uh, 1.9.3, and we're starting to try and get out of um, the perceived performance detriment, uh, performance hit of, of Ruby 1.8.7. Uh, Ruby Enterprise Edition was out around this time too, which was kind of a performance optimized version of 1.8.7 uh, that the folks behind Fusion Passenger sold. Um, Ruby two, uh, Rails 3.2, uh, Ruby 2.2 .2, or 2.0, .2 uh, Rails 4 and Rails 4.2 um, all followed. At the company, um, it's now about 2013, and a new CTO has arrived, and um, not long after, there's a, a new development director as well. And here we start seeing some process and organizational changes. And the team is starting to get out of the mindset of shipping everything as soon as possible, and more thinking about having very like batched work um, building things to be more testable, you know, we're, we have, there's much further to go with this. And really trying to, you know, have the technical management provide kind of an umbrella for development to basically shield them from, you know, incoming requests that are, you know, important questions to answer, but maybe it's like, you know, are you happier having folks answer questions or do you need feature shift? And trying to figure out a, a good balance of that. And then we had uh, product managers come in as well. So to basically you know, take input from the business about how to shape feature work and that sort of thing, bugs that needed to get, get addressed, questions that needed answering, um, rather than taking that input directly from the business itself. And so work continued, but the upgrades did not. So in time, uh, the, the requirement to have kind of that lockstep that I talked about where everything is gonna be on Ruby 1.8.7 and Rails 2.3, that got lifted. But as consensus was building to, uh, for an upgrade, to say, hey, you know, we, we really need to, to catch up with, with where the community's at, uh, Vitalsource bought its primary competitor in uh, 2014. The competitor was uh, uh, CoreSmart. Uh, they were, they had roughly the, the equivalent size business as Vitalsource did. And Vitalsource then had to engage in the work of basically absorbing and digesting and changing uh, all the applications to you know, take on this new business. That took about 18 months uh, from uh, 2014 to, to mid-2015. And that was everything from migrating users, you know, picking up you know, new publishing agreements, um, identifying functionality that existed in one place but not in the other and making sure that it was present for what was gonna be, what was gonna exist going forward. And then beginning work on a new combined storefront with features that CoreSmart had but Vitalsource did not. And of course, Rails and Ruby kept moving. And so now these seven, five to 10 year old applications, you know, we're still stuck at Ruby 1.8.7 and, and 2.3 and now had an 18 month hit on them being able to, uh, to deploy. We come to act three, where we actually get to the big upgrade. It's fall 2005, and most of the work of integrating CoreSmart has been completed. And a plan was made to get the applications upgraded. And part of that was our CTO, Al, basically, you know, he's, really an operations fellow at heart, wants us you know, to focus on minimal downtime, um, you know, or no downtime deployments, that sort of thing, uh, really avoiding operational impacts on the business where we can. And at that time, it was getting very hard to get continued support for Ruby 187 and Rails 2.3. Uh, you could, there were some corners where you could still get security support for them, but by and large, that had ended. So the upgrade process got its start, and it was mostly a parallel effort across uh, each of the applications. And it was basically, it, we took it as a stepwise progression from Rails 3.0 from 2.3. When that was done, we went to 3.1. When that was done and settled, we went to 3.2, and to 4.0, and to 4.1, and to 4.2. Um, we did the similar stepwise 
process through Ruby, largely interspersed with the versions of Ruby that would have corresponded with the version of Rails at the time. And that took, I think I did about seven months to get through everything and get it shipped, tested, um, and, and out and stable. Some of the challenges that came along with that were um, mixing urgent work and upgrade work. We had a problem keeping uh, divergent code, code bases shippable, where if we have a, the bulk of the work on these upgrades happening, uh, there was further back changes that would have bug fixes applied and then we had to basically bring those bug fixes forward or we would have fixed bugs in the upgrade version and then might have to backport something. And just trying to keep all of that balanced out was fairly challenging. And further to the fact that these seven applications all shared a database. And so we had to basically coordinate all the cross-application dependencies such that the applications could go out in the right order such that they would all continue to function when they shipped on the new code bases or on the upgraded code bases. So some notable challenges with that. Um, there were a lot of things about upgrading uh, Rails that kind of like forced, the, forced their hand at 3.0 uh, where there was functionality that came in, in uh, before one that got deprecated at two and finally removed in three. We had to move off of RJ templates to, uh, to native JavaScript. Uh, we had to transition fully to, to ERB. We incorporated the asset pipeline at, at long last. And then there was a lot of restructuring of active record queries because there had been a lot of work that had gone in, in with active record in that amount of time and we got to, finally got to take advantage of that. The teams also shifted. So what had basically been, you know, a, a kind of a, a few silos here and there, um, there was an API and platform team that focused on, on backend stuff. Um, they had had a changeover in personnel, and then um, that team then, then grew with some additional hiring. And then for the front end applications uh, like Connect, there were additional hires brought in, and then there was additional technical management and product management brought in to help those applications as well. And then using kind of some of the lessons learned that we'll talk about in a little bit, a new application uh, was started and it basically took kind of the hard lessons of database coupling uh, versus API layers and you know, we actually were able to, to say, okay, we're, we're gonna not go down that same path. And so when that new product started in early 2016, it basically, instead of hooking into the same database, it's had the hard requirement of we're going to use an API layer instead. And whatever data it needed locally, it would save locally. Uh, but anything that was in the core database over in Phoenix had to go over an API and would not actually directly touch the database. And because how Rails is, is being used has also evolved in that amount of time, it's Rails on the server side, uh, but it's delivered as a single page app using React on the client side. And that's been a model for more of our apps that we're, that we're using going forward. And it seems to be working really well for us. We also start getting into some technical culture shifts here. And the beginnings of some increased code review culture, uh, more collaborative work, which is, which is really good. So we come to act four, and that is growing the code with a, with a guided technical approach. The review culture gets stronger earlier, and here we, we come out of, we, we shift our code reviews earlier. We don't have a, a single uh, person able to review or like responsible for the, for the final sign off, and so we're not waiting for that sign off to happen and potentially, potentially throwing work back. We start a, a version four of our API layer, and here we're taking JSON as the first preference with XML supported for, ex, for external APIs, but as the second choice. Um, JSON, you know, at least in, in our opinion, is far, far more pleasant to work with than, than some of the large JavaScript or the large XML pieces that we've been working with. We start returning meaningful error messages <laughs> with our APIs and we're basically able to take the experience of, 
uh, the earlier versions and in integrations and incorporate that into that design. We're doing more opportunistic refactoring now. So lots of um, logic extractions into classes, a lot of, you know, like, oh, hey, let's set up controllers in this different way. Um, we, we went very controller heavy with our code uh, early on. And so now it's, prob it's probably closer to what folks would expect more of now, and that's you know, more use of surface objects, use cases uh, for some of the newer applications, and then really trying to you know, only have the controllers handle your interaction with the business object instead of directly you know, trying to do everything as they had been doing before. As part of that, we're also moving towards uh, basically treating uh, the API as how you're gonna interact with the core data in the central database. Uh, so you know, I think in time, what we're looking to do is kind of get away from having shared models between code bases. We're going to get away from having shared migrations that have to run in one repository and then you have to take the, copy the database schema over to the other repositories to get that in sync. And then basically anything, any data interaction takes place over an API transaction. And then we've been, you know, as folks have been using the UI pieces more, we're also increasing you know, the amount of work that we do for API and integration work, um, both internally and externally. The other nice thing about getting to, getting to this point is that each team has the, the ownership of when they upgrade to new versions of Rails and Ruby. And so it's possible for them to you know, update to 2.4 and 5.0, basically when they feel that they're ready to and, and want to take that work on. Uh, the team that I'm working on currently, we're probably gonna take this work on in the next month or two. And then finally, we're gonna take on a, a UX refresh of the core application because it hasn't changed a whole lot since 2005 when it was initially written. We're gonna be increasing our automated test coverage, um, basically filling pieces in. Uh, development culture is shifting towards keep the build green, um, make sure there's tests, write code that is easier to test, and you know, when we're writing new features, let's actually lead with having the automated testing done when that feature ships instead of trying to fill it in later. And process-wise, we're refining. We've gone from, uh, most teams have gone from Scrum um, to Kanban, and each team kind of gets to iterate on its own practices and how they, how they handle their business in terms of you know, taking new work in from the business, where they retrospect, uh, putting new processes or taking processes away, that sort of thing. And in time, we're moving uh, some of these apps towards a well-earned retirement. Uh, our early service layer is, uh, is due uh, to, to be replaced with our v4 layer. Uh, with more up-to-date um, authentication mechanisms and, and more RESTful APIs. Our two reporting applications that were written against this code base are being replaced with a more capable uh, ETL-based um, reporting application that's being written by another development team. And you know, essentially, we're, we're taking the opportunity to say, you know, it's okay to let these go. We don't have to keep, it, we don't have to keep these applications going um, in order to have the value for the other things that, are, that we're still working on. So uh, some tools and methods that I think are, are generally applicable to, to teams that are, that are working with uh, you know, code bases that are older than say six months or two years or what, or what have you. Uh, code Climate, if you use it, uh, has a churn and complexity graph. And so what can be really neat uh, to look at with this is basically find out uh, what you have kind of in the upper right hand corner. Find out, you know, and then figure out how you want to dig into, okay, why are we changing this a lot? And why is the code quality suspect for the changes that we have to make? And, you know, accordingly, what kind of changes can we make to uh, pull that complexity and churn score down? You know, can we, can we extract logic? Can we, you know, break apart some complexity into more easily testable things? things that don't have to change as much. GitHub uh, has code frequency graphs. Um, this is for uh, the um, Phoenix application. And if you look at, kind of on the far right around uh, 2015, um, on the right-hand side, you'll see kind of some spikes there. 
that was where we were doing our upgrade work. Uh, you'll remember, uh, if you go back, uh, it, I'll have it up on the screen again, uh, but the commits kind of like, we had a big spike in commits, but overall the code added and subtracted didn't change a whole lot, uh, or at least nearly as much as what we had back in, if you look, 2009. So if you're looking back through your code base, you can look at, oh, what happened around this time frame that necessitated so many changes going on in the code base. That's, that's kind of an area to dig into and look at more thoroughly. Here's another one from um, uh, P2 services, where basically we see a, bit, you know, a bunch of the spikes uh, at different points, and so those are also things that we could dig into. GitHub also can show you the complete history for individual files. So if you go into a, a tree view for, for any commit hash, um, you pick out a file that you want to look at, and then there's a nice history button, and then it'll give you a nice graphical look at everything that, that has happened on that file in that repository. And that can be, the, you'll see the commit message, but you can also dive into context with the other hashes and see what's going on there. I also think it's very helpful to, to look at project release history. So we're using Rails, we, ha we use a number of gems, um, we have our own project release history. These are all things that we can draw from to basically kind of figure out what's happened in a project and figure out how those, how those changes in our dependencies influences the direction of our project. We also have Git log. And I use this to, to assemble the, the, uh, the commit chart that I, that I put up next, but you basically have an incredibly rich tool um, to just both kind of like dig into you know, commits by committer, you can get a range of commits you know, after a certain date, before a certain date, show me the last 100 commits, show me commits that touch this file on the command line, and it's all incredibly fast. <laughs> but the nice thing is that you can also um, do some data exports with this, and so that's how I actually got to this here, and that's, um, you can basically uh, format and export from git log which I'll show you here, where you basically define the format that you want to use, and then I do a little bit of a cleanup after the fact, and then I end up with commit lines that look like this as a pipe of the limited file, and then I wrote a small Rails application um, to basically pull all that in, and then I can throw that to um, a library called ChartKick, uh, which, will act, which actually spits out uh, this graphic right here, where you can actually see what the commits are um, over time. And then you can also do like grouping by week, by month, by thing, and then depending on how you import that data, you can do some other nifty slicing and dicing with it as well. Git itself is a very wonderful tool. Um, I wanted to get into this for, the, for this presentation, but I, I couldn't quite get to it. Um, Git is a time machine. So I could go back to any point in time in these projects and basically start over from how those projects looked at a given point in time. So if I wanted to go back to 2010 and see what those projects looked like, I could, in theory, spin those up. And my thought there is, you know, if you can get a, a virtual machine using a version of Linux from back then, or a Docker container with, you know, with the right version of Linux, you can get the right version of Ruby installed, the right version of Rails installed, and then kind of set that code base up as it would have existed at that time, and kind of be able to look at things and say, oh, okay, I can put myself back in context for what happened back then. Um, that could be valuable to you if you want to, it's like, hey, where did this happen? Why did we do it this way? You can, you can learn from that. And then kind of the bigger piece, um, or the, I, I should say as big a piece of this for me, was uh, talking with folks who had been involved in this uh, from the, from the very beginning or over the life cycle of these applications, both from, uh, from a development standpoint and uh, from a business standpoint. Uh, they're not always gonna be available. Uh, you may not have access to, uh, to every participant. I, I got good responses from most of the people I contacted though and that was very helpful. And where you can talk to folks to get context for why certain businesses, business decisions were made, why certain, certain code is structured the way that it is, that can all be very helpful. I do find it very helpful to, to kind of approach this in a um, I'm curious manner, not, a, uh, not an accusatory fashion. 
So my questions were, I tried to phrase my questions with kindness. Like, you know, like, hey, you know, can you tell me about uh, what happened around this? Can you tell me about what, the, what it was like working on this project uh, back when everything was brand new? And some of the feedback that I got around this uh, was pretty interesting. And um, two pieces I got from uh, one of our developers, uh, Tommy Stokes, was that you know, we all learn as we go and get better with time. And so don't look at code from six years ago as an evaluation of how a developer is now. And then you can also look at the code and think that you know, if this could have been implemented in a better fashion, or it could have been tested better, there's probably a, a really good reason why it wasn't at the time. Um, and that could be because of business requirements and deadlines, it could be because of a developer's own experience, uh, it could just be general technical limitations. And so some lessons that are available with this. Um, and uh, just a, a thing about lessons available, uh, oftentimes um, we hear like lessons learned uh, but I, I saw something recently where they said lessons available just because um, you weren't necessarily guaranteed to learn, just that that lesson was available to you. So here, uh, getting to MVP was critical uh, because there was overwork uh, and we needed better automation tooling. And shifting, shifting gears to allow external access to the application uh, is something that was kind of a big change for the teams and one that is still kind of rippling out. Um, and then the upgrade itself took, took a long time and that stalled innovation. There's always more that we can do in terms of refactoring business logic, um, particularly moving towards a single responsibility principle. Shared, shared migrations and models have not served as well. It, it's a headache for all of us trying to move things intelligently through the application that causes test breakage. Um, you know, the apps are overly coupled for how they really could be. But there's a joy in writing Rails versus other software development. Um, you know, for Dan Benjamin, when he started the project, it was preferable to writing a, a hybrid PHP and Java solution. And for one of our other developers, Erin uh, Zarpa, working with Rails was the first moment she felt she enjoyed software development. If we'd understood where we would be now, we probably would have, you know, in terms of allowing external access, the number of customers we would have, um, how much stuff would be coming in, uh, we would have looked at structuring our data and our applications a bit differently. At the API layer, um, making uh, the errors more clean, clear and descriptive, uh, having good documentation, um, not treating every response as a 200 OK, <laughs> regardless of what happens with it, is, is a big one for us. Um, we have to keep that in some areas because that's what the expectation is, but that's not one that we want to keep. And I think one of, the, one of the most important things I'm left with is expect that you know, my current, my, my present, my prior colleagues did the best work that they could uh, given their knowledge and understanding and circumstances at the time. And so I approach, I approach this with love and, and kindness to try and really put myself in the shoes that they were in when, when this happened and trying to understand this contextually. And understanding that everybody learns as a project goes on, best practices evolve, and new perspectives are gonna come in and add distinctiveness as, as people come and go on a team. But Rails has served us very well for the last 12 years and will continue to do so for, the, for these applications. And you know, it's been surprising that you know, the, everything has been as stable as it has been. We are changing the UX. This is how it looked uh, back when uh, Dan started this project back in 2005. And we are recently kind of giving it a UX facelift. And so soon it will look like this. And that, this caused audible gasps when this was uh, demoed last week. People were astonished that it was like, oh wow, it's changing, finally. <laughs> and the other thing that was interesting, and I've, I've got just a little bit of time left so I need to wrap up, but the business took a big risk. Rails was not at 1.0 yet, when, and so they had a business critical need, and they, they, they took a leap of faith in going with Rails when it would have been very easy to say no. So it's kind of with a mix of astonishment, um, that it's gone on so long, um, and 
it has more potential to fulfill. So um, I have some thank yous uh, to run through really quick, but I, I got some invaluable research uh, assistance with uh, some interviews. Uh, the software that I used to build this own presentation was on Rails 5 um, and so on. And uh, I'm online uh, at Base 10, uh, and these slides will be available at wallscorp.us uh, slash presentations probably sometime in the next week or so. Um, and you'll, you'll see stuff uh, when the conference uh, releases slides as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all being here, and enjoy the rest of your conference.